The Acolyte Episode 4 is here, and it's every bit as brainless as Episode 3, but not quite as proud. The Jedi are as useless as ever, Kiyoti Mundi is a time traveler now, and the Sith can fly. They fly now? They fly now! This show is made by people who have absolutely no idea about any of the pre-established Star Wars lore, but thankfully, Dave Filoni is a fierce custodian of canon, and as lore master, he would never dream of letting people like this screw over his beloved franchise. Wait, never mind, the only thing Filoni is master of is retconning the works of more talented writers, so it's no surprise that he happily stood back and let this show get butchered by these people. But the destruction of canon isn't even the worst problem with this show. I don't even think the extremely obvious political agenda is the worst problem with this show. No, the biggest issue is simply the fact that these people cannot write. They can't write a coherent story to save their lives, they can't write interesting consistent characters with reliable motives, and don't even get me started on the dialogue, it's all just so bad. I'd give this episode a 2 out of 10. It was better than last week's 1 out of 10, but I would still struggle to find one single thing that I liked about it, aside from the visuals occasionally looking decent. So let's get into spoilers. We open with the Padawan who is perfect in every way and she's learning swordsmanship. I'm surprised she's not teaching it given how overconfident and prone to lectures she is, but anyway. Osha shows up to say goodbye and flirt with her some more, despite the fact that Jackie appears to be underage. Pretty sure there's no canonical age for this girl yet, and I know the actress is not that young, but they've very clearly depicted her to seem like she's in her mid to late teens as far as I can tell. I mean maybe they just did that to try to invoke some nostalgia from Clone Wars fans by reminding us of a far better character in Ahsoka. And to be honest, I didn't even overly like Ahsoka in earlier Clone Wars either, but that's not the point here. The point is that Osha keeps flirting with this girl who feels too young for this to be acceptable. Ah, hey, but it's not Osha's fault. She was groomed as a child by her two mothers to join their coven of lesbian witches. Yeah, consider me unsurprised to find her doing the same thing to another minor now that she's grown up. And it's awful that she was raised in that environment, but not every victim grows up to be a perpetrator. I guess I should say, at least Osha isn't trying to force Jackie to become a witch against her will, but still. Next time I'm on Coruscant, though, I'll look you up. And we'll go to a cantina and trade stories about Master Soul. This is our heroine, guys, inviting a seemingly underage girl out to a cantina for a date. Pretty sure you'll need a fake ID if you want to take her up on that offer, Jackie. And by the way, I'm definitely not imagining this flirting. The actress who plays Jackie apparently confirmed it in an interview. But after flirting with her old master's new apprentice, Osha randomly decides not to bother saying goodbye to Master Soul herself. Yeah, never mind him. He's only the one good role model you've ever had in your entire life. Forget him. He's just a stupid man, and your eyes are only for girls. Meanwhile on... Kofar? Really? That's the name you're going with? Was Sneezar taken? What are we going to name this planet? Some random guy in the background starts coughing. Perfect! Thank you, sir! Now, um, how do you spell that? And yeah, I'm aware I'm nitpicking in the absolute extremes when I make fun of a planet name, but if this show was actually good, I wouldn't be so bored that I noticed stupid stuff like this. So, meanwhile in the cough world, May and her drunken apothecary are searching for discount Chewbacca, and it's starting to become more clear to me that fake Ezra Miller is working really, really, really hard to oversell his drunken fool act. I know bounty hunters won't set foot in these forests. Oh, but you have. I already thought there was more to him than he was letting on, but now I'm even more certain. There's a chance he may be the Sith Lord himself, but I still think it's more likely that that is one of Osha and May's mothers who survived and became the Sith. I'm leaning towards the Zabrak because we didn't see her body, but it could have been the other one too. Either way, even if Ezra Miller isn't the Sith, he's clearly more in the know than he's letting on. I mean, somehow he's skilled enough to track a Wookiee Jedi deep into a dangerous forest all on his own when even the Jedi needed some stupid sniffer thing to track him. How he managed to locate this Jedi and escape undetected is another question, but that one probably comes down to the fact that these writers have consistently throughout this entire series shown no signs of understanding that Jedi can sense life presence around them, or force usage, or light or dark. Anyway, back at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, a bunch of Jedi are studying footage of Mei fighting Sol, and I just realized it might actually make sense why Yord was watching through binoculars in Episode 2 despite the fact that the fight was happening right below him. The binoculars might have a built-in holocam to record the fight. That's just me taking a guess, but it also explains away the fact that they have holo footage of her fighting, and it explains Yord's bizarre, bizarre actions, so I guess it's probably the reason? Nice, I suppose. She's fast, says one of the Jedi, despite the fact that we all have eyes and we've seen her fight. She's really not fast. She got absolutely clowned by Sol. At least that Jedi does add, she's fast but weak. Her emotions guide her every choice in combat. But before they can discuss this any further, a time traveler shows up and they all lose their minds. Who the hell are you? Sol demands as Kiadi Mundi emerges from a DeLorean roughly 40 years before his own birth. Okay, maybe that's not quite how it goes. There's no time travel, no DeLoreans, but Master Mundi is here inexplicably despite the fact that he shouldn't even be alive yet. 
I'd almost rather a DeLorean. Hey, but Mundy never had a canonical birth year or age. It was all in Legends. Disney canon never specified it. Don't care. It showed a complete disrespect and disregard for the franchise when you do this. It was disrespectful when Filoni retconned Mandalorians back in the Clone Wars, ruining whole series of novels such as Republic Commando. And it's disrespectful now. It shows that you do not care. You wanted Mundy to use in your episode as fan service, and you didn't give a damn how it went against all past law. You just went ahead and broke that law, discarded it, replaced it with your own nonsense. That is not the mark of a talented writer. Retcons are unfortunate no matter who does them and no matter the circumstances. Sure, George himself was known to retcon a lot of stuff, but he's the creator. If anyone's entitled to do it, it's him. The biggest difference when George did it is that we were still having fun, so it didn't seem to matter as much. We could argue over whether the original Boba Fett voice was better or worse than Timuera Morrison's redub in the original trilogy, but regardless of where we landed, we couldn't deny that Django and Boba Fett were cool characters. When you have a show like this that has nothing good about it, nothing fun except to laugh at the dumpster fire, everybody becomes a lot more fixated on retcons like this because there's nothing good to distract us. Do I overly care that they changed the age of Kiati Mundi? No, not in isolation. If they had a good reason to need him in this show and they were going to do him justice, I could have forgiven it. But they didn't. They just wanted to do some empty fan service and they didn't care if it contradicted the past lore in the process. And by the way, it's not like we're only calling this out when Disney does it. Even some of George's retcons in the past have been wholesale rejected by fans. Ask any Star Wars fan who shot first and almost all of them will say Han even though George edited the footage to make Greedo shoot first. We don't care. We almost unanimously decided to ignore that change because it changes Han's character in ways that we do not like. So if George himself couldn't get away with that retcon, I'm not sure why Leslie Headland expected to get a pass. But enough about Mundy's law-breaking time travel, let's get to the way the show actually depicts his character, because it feels all wrong to me. I've never been a huge fan of Kiati Mundy. I don't even know what novels or comics center around him, if any, so I wouldn't even know where to begin to learn more about him. But based on what I remember from his few lines in the prequels, this skin suit bears very little resemblance to him. He sounds weird, he looks even weirder, but that's the least of his problems. The first major issue is that he's an absolute half-wit, which is not the case in the prequels. She doesn't know her master's identity. An apprentice who doesn't know their master. It's absurd. No, that makes perfect sense for a dark side assassin. You did tell them she was using the dark side, didn't you, Sol? Probably the craziest thing about this show is that we're four episodes in and I'm not even confident the writers are aware of the light side and dark side of the force. It's like that time Amazon adapted the Wheel of Time and conveniently forgot to include any mention of the fact that the magic in that world is gendered male and female because it didn't fit with the story they wanted to tell. Forget about the world building the original creator built the whole franchise on, let's just twist that to suit what we want to do. Typical Hollywood narcissism. As far as I recall, there's been no mention of black and white concepts in this show, no mention of light side and dark side, just the force, as if it doesn't matter how you choose to access it. I fully understand why they did it. They don't care about the law. They want to twist morality on its head and promote evil, and they can't do that with language so uninclusive as light and dark. But because I actually have some level of understanding of Star Wars, I know about the light and the dark, and it is absolutely absurd to pretend that the Jedi wouldn't be severely alarmed by an encounter with a dark side assassin. It would be the first thing they mention. It's one thing to encounter a skilled force user who has gone rogue. It's another thing entirely to encounter a skilled dark side assassin. That should put the hair up on the backs of their necks. They should be far more concerned than they are, especially if that dark side assassin has already killed two Jedi Masters. And as Dispro pointed out on Twitter, one of the Jedi called her weak specifically because she's ruled by her emotions, yet in Star Wars lore that's the exact thing that gives Sith their power. The whole point is that it's easier to give in to your emotions than control them, and that's one of the ways that the Jedi are superior to Sith. The Sith take the easy path to feed on their emotions and fuel the dark side, whereas the Jedi pursue inner peace which helps them connect with the light side. So again, if this show understood how the Force works, none of these characters would behave this way or say this nonsense. But back on Mundy's stupid line, why the hell is it beyond his comprehension that an evil dark side force user might want to keep their identity a secret even from their apprentice? Why does he assume it's even a direct master-apprentice relationship at all? For all he knows, May could be one of a whole sect of assassins trained by this mysterious force user. It makes perfect sense to keep his identity secret, but no, Mundy thinks it's absurd. And this guy goes on to become a member of the High Jedi Council, ladies and gentlemen. Apparently Yoda was in the business of promoting absolute fools. Could this be a splinter order? 
I assume what she means by this is that it could be some kind of splinter sect of Jedi in the far reaches of the galaxy. That wouldn't be the first time that this has happened in Star Wars lore, though the example I'm thinking of does happen chronologically later in the timeline than this. During the Clone Wars era, Jedi Master Jin Altus split off from the Jedi Council and formed his own Jedi sect, who still served the Republic but followed a different code to the Jedi traditions. One of the key differences was the fact that his sect allowed attachments, including marriage. So yeah, Splinter Sect can break away from the Jedi, but again, they would not be asking this if Sol had bothered to tell them that Mei was using the dark side. Or if they did still pursue this theory, they would be far more alarmed than this by the idea that there's a whole sect of dark Jedi out there. This whole scene is just nonsense on every level, but it only gets worse the more you think about it. Because the Jedi knew Osha and Mei were force sensitive. That was the whole point of last episode. They knew the girls had both been trained by evil dark side witches. Osha could already use the force, sorry, thread, by the the time that Sol took her to join the Jedi, so it would have been safe for him to assume that Mei could also use the thread. Even if Osha never explicitly told him, he would have had to know. So why are they all surprised then that Mei can use the Force when they already know she can use the Force? Sure, most of the Jedi are only finding out about Mei for the first time right now, but it makes no sense why Sol is just standing there watching them theorize on who trained her when there is a very obvious answer. Her two mothers trained her how to use the Force as a child and she carried that knowledge forward in life. So now it becomes a much more narrow question. Who taught her to fight like that? But there's no reason they would even have to assume it's a force user at all. She could have studied under any martial arts instructor and found a way to combine the conventional martial arts with force usage to become this supposed lethal assassin. I guess he knows from reading her mind that she does have a master, but still they're jumping to conclusions here without considering all of their options. Oh, but Sol heard the apothecary mention May's master. No, he heard him mention a mysterious he. He just assumed it was a master, which is definitely one possible option, but the guy could have meant anything. May could be a bounty hunter and this guy could be referring to her client and saying he will be so pleased. The fact that they didn't use Jedi mind tricks on him to get to the bottom of this is absolutely absurd, all because he asked them not to? The heck? I've said in a previous review that I'm glad they didn't use their Jedi mind tricks because that's actually quite a morally questionable skill. Invading people's minds, stealing their memories, compelling their speech, thoughts and actions, those abilities range from immoral to downright evil and I have a big problem when the Jedi use them. But this show, they've been continually using those powers over and over until the one moment where it would make most sense for them to use them and they just don't bother. Suspicious. It's almost like the plot required them not to mind read that guy. Either he's the Sith Lord and they would have been unable to read his mind, or they would have found out a whole lot more useful information that he is obviously hiding in his mind, because he's clearly closer to that Sith than he lets on. Anyway, all of this is to say that Sol and the other Jedi are completely overlooking the fact that they already know Mei has been trained in dark side force use by her own parents. And it would be pretty simple to explain this away. Sol could have simply said, we checked with Osha and she said Mei was never this strong as a child. She's clearly had much more extensive training than what the witches gave her. And suddenly the whole issue is sorted, but they don't mention it because the writers didn't think of it because they're as dumb as sand. But after they decided Jedi must have taught May, Master Mundy voices the first smart thought he's had all episode. We must alert the High Council. Yes! I'm shocked that they have not already been alerted! Two Jedi Masters are dead and you have just now encountered the first dark side assassin in hundreds of years! How in the galaxy did you think it was a good idea to keep this from the High Council? You are all a bunch of insubordinate traitors! Every last one of you should be kicked out of the Order! It's not insubordination if they're just too dumb to have considered alerting the Council! No, you're right, that's just room temperature IQ. This is treason. The High Council would be obliged to inform the Senate. You are evil! Evil! Stop leading the Jedi astray! I cannot believe they are all going along with this! I guess when you're written by people with this view of truth, lying becomes second nature to you. I told the truth. It was the right thing to do. If only things were so simple, Osha. So the green Nepo bitch orders some random Jedi to extract the Wookiee and intercept Mei. And again we get another brain dead interaction. Extract Kalnaka from his post on Kofar and intercept Mei. And if she doesn't come peacefully? Not expecting it to come to that. Okay, so... Respectfully, Master, I don't care what you're expecting. Tell me what the rules of engagement are so I know what to prepare for. Imagine if when Obama sent SEAL Team 6 into Pakistan to get Bin Laden, the team leader asked, what if he resists, Mr. President? And Obama just said, eh, I doubt he will. That would be unfathomably stupid, but even worse would be if the team leader just accepted that as the answer and didn't press the issue, which is exactly what happens here. Who wrote this nonsense? So with that, the bald green faced lady ends the meeting and that's the last we hear of Mundy in this episode, so I suppose I should finish the point I was making about him. It's not just that he's dumb, it's not just that he's insubordinate and complicit in a scheme to hide the dark side assassin from the High Council, it's also the fact that his lines and actions in the Phantom Menace now make absolutely no sense. 
After Qui-Gon encountered Maul on Tatooine, he reported to the Council and Mundy said, Impossible. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. But now, that has been kind of undermined by this episode. And I say kind of because so far, Mundy has not seen outright proof of Sith involvement in this show. He's merely seen evidence of a rogue force user, possibly Darkseid if the writers knew that was a thing that existed. And he's heard hints of a mysterious master. Now, I think that should still set off his Sith radar, but I have to be fair, not every Dark Jedi is a Sith. But after facing Darth Maul, Qui-Gon's immediate assumption is that he's a Sith Lord. He says, He was trained in the Jedi arts. My only conclusion is that he was a Sith Lord. And Mundy outright rejects it as impossible without hesitation. You would think, if we were to try to line this up with his experience in the Acolyte, that he would say something like what I just said, not every Dark Jedi is a Sith. And then he could follow up with, the Sith have been extinct for more than a millennium, but this is not the first time we've encountered lower tier Dark Side assassins. And then Qui-Gon could respond with something like, this was no low tier assassin. He was more than my match in saber combat and I could feel the hate radiating off him. I have never felt such darkness. But the point is I shouldn't have to rewrite scenes from The Phantom Menace just to make it mesh with this soulless prequel that came out 15 years later. If I have to do that it means your prequel of a show failed. And we could have avoided all these issues so easily simply by not bringing Kiyadi Mundi into the damn show that set decades before his birth. It's really that simple. Just don't screw with the law you idiots, especially not the law of the main films. Because we haven't even finished touching on all the ways it makes Mundy look like a fool. Qui-Gon mentions Anakin Skywalker at that same council meeting, the boy he correctly believes to be the fulfillment of the Chosen One prophecy, and he says, it is possible he was conceived by the midi-chlorians. At no point does Mundy speak up and say, oh yeah, we saw that happen a hundred years ago with a couple of lesbian space witches who manipulated the dark side to create two force-sensitive twins. It's nothing new, don't worry about it. Oh, but the Jedi didn't know that's how the girls were created. I'm willing to bet that Sol and the other three knew, that's probably what we're going to find out later in this show. We'll have to wait and see for sure, but even if they didn't know or figure out what happened back when they met the Coven, I find it highly unlikely that Sol wouldn't have investigated it further or asked Osha. And maybe Osha herself doesn't know, but she would know enough for him to piece it together. She was there when her mother was monologuing to the lunatic asylum about how the thread blessed them with the miracle of life. Oh, but Sol didn't tell Mundy about that. Why the hell not? Why is Sol such an idiot that he continuously keeps key information from the very people who are best equipped to help him sort this mess out? What was the point of that whole little meeting if not to bring the other Jedi up to speed. Hey, but Sal didn't want them to know what evil deeds he and his Jedi did to the fellow witches. Maybe. Time will tell. We don't even know what they did yet, but the time for secrecy is over. Two Jedi are dead. Face up to your mistakes and put an end to it before it's too late. Seriously, when I first heard the premise of this show, I thought the way they were going to have to keep it in line with canon would be that the Sith would have to kill everyone who even gets a hint of his existence. I didn't think they'd just make it so all the Jedi are so retarded that everybody keeps secrets from everybody for no good reason, and nobody ever finds out the full story simply because mistrust runs rampant throughout the Jedi Order. This is magnificently idiotic. And the last thing I'll say about this complete ruination of Kiyadi Mundi is this. Where the hell was Dave? Is it not Filoni's job to guard the lore of Star Wars and make sure everything remains true? Is he not the custodian of canon? This is literally his job to say no to this idiotic mess. Imagine how much of a pussy you have to be to not stand up and say, sorry Leslie, but you'll have to pick a different Jedi or make one up because Mundy wasn't even alive at this time and even if he was, this will contradict directly the lines that George wrote for him. Instead, Filoni seems to have just gone along with it, opening the gates of Star Wars canon so that anything can pass by him now. What an absolute coward. What a corporate lapdog. I'm tired of fans being sold out by the very people who are supposed to be protecting the franchise. Of course, with Filoni it's no surprise, this man has disrespected so much past lore himself that he's practically the king of retcons. But I'm tired of everybody looking past that and proclaiming him to be the saviour of Star Wars. This is your saviour. This is what he has allowed Star Wars to become. What a joke. Anyway, I guess I've got to now rush through the rest of the episode because I spent so much time on Monday, but it was worth it. Nepotism decides to try to play compassion out of nowhere. Why didn't you tell me there was a chance this poor girl survived? Lady, a few days ago, back when you thought this was Osha, one of your own, you strongly implied that you wanted me to go outside the law to stop her. You wanted me to deny her a fair trial just to keep things hush-hush. Now you're coming at me acting like I'm the one in the wrong and you're some kind of paragon of empathy and compassion? Get threaded. A thread woven through all of existence. Not exactly sure what get threaded means, but it sounds like a good insult for Sol to use here. Instead, Sol says something brain dead as usual. What I saw her fall. No one could have survived that. And yet she did, and you should have sensed it. Meanwhile, back with May, we have the most unemotional line delivery I've ever seen. Can't believe my sister Jedi scum 
She sounds almost bored by her own voice, which might be the first time I've found myself in agreement with her. And also, how can you not believe Osha is a Jedi? The last time you saw her, she desperately wanted to become one. Also, also, she's not even a Jedi. You saw her. She was clearly not dressed in Jedi robes. She was carrying a blaster, not a lightsaber. She's not a Jedi. The Apothecary says that Osha seemed really fond of Sol, but there was never even a point where he saw them interacting fondly, and clearly she's not that fond of him if she couldn't even be bothered saying goodbye before leaving. Found the time to flirt with his Padawan though, didn't we? And speaking of Osha, Sol does manage to catch up with her before she leaves, because obviously he does. The show wouldn't really work if Osha just went back to her old life as a mechanic. There is still good in her. The part of her that loves you. Really? I'll kill you. She's got a funny way of showing it. Fine. But I'm not wearing that civilian robe. The heck is a civilian robe? Is it just a hoodie thing? Why would they force her to wear that? For what possible reason? Just to insert this overplayed cliche of, I am not doing this, cut to them doing the thing. That's some Wattpad fanfic type humor. I know this because I used to get all these atrocious writing advice posts suggested on Instagram, and those were the exact types of people who frothed over this kind of joke. Tells you the caliber of writers we have on this show, doesn't it? Yord proves yet again to be the village idiot as he delivers a briefing. The order stationed Master Kalnaka on Kofar, but no one has heard from him in over a year. What? And nobody even bothered to go and check on him for a whole year? How do these Jedi get more and more incompetent by the very second? Then we meet Basil. Not even kidding, they named this stupid little alien tracker Basil of all things. How did we manage to write a show where the main character is named OSHA and somehow she's still not the worst name of the show? Also Osha, you don't have to shush your droid, you can just turn it off. That's Basil. Is he or they with us? Sorry, did you want to get immersed in our world? Yeah, well guess what? F***ing pronouns! In current day Californian shit. You're gonna need to hand that blaster over. Well, it's, it's mine now. Well, it's actually the property of the Jedi Order, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist that you hand it over. If it's a problem for her to have the blaster, then why was it never confiscated until now, like days later? The locals say he ventured off into the forest and never came back. Kalaka is in there. Yes, did you not just hear your Padawan two seconds ago? I'm concerned for your safety, Yord says to Osha, right after trying to force her to hand over her best weapon of defense, the blaster. Also, why did he give up on that so easily? Makes literally no sense. I'm gonna need you to hand over the blaster. No, you don't. Yes, I must insist. Never mind, no, keep it. What? Also, is Osha asking Yord to kill May? Sol thinks that May can be saved, but if it comes to it, and she doesn't listen to me. You need to stop her. I won't be able to do it. Wow, she really doesn't care about her sister, does she? This whole thing makes no sense. Her desires and motives change by the second. I'm still reeling from the fact that this episode really started out with her going, okay, cool, I saw May with my own eyes. I know she's alive. Now I'm perfectly happy to disappear and never see her again, leaving the Jedi to do whatever they want with her. Couldn't care if they killed her, arrested her, or let her go. Not my problem. Couldn't care less if she kills Sol. Don't care if she comes back from the darkness. Don't even care about helping her. Don't care about saving her. I just want to go be a mechnic. She's a mechnic. 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 This is just so absurd. Why would you do that, you absolute freak? Don't touch things. How is that a hard concept to grasp? And why would you wait so long to react? Why are you so dumb, Osha? I have it. I love how Sol didn't even bother putting himself between Osha and the threat. It's just like, nah, she's expendable. I got another part of one now. I don't care. Whatever. It's attracted to light. Um, it may not be. Jackie says it's attracted to light, but it could be anything. Could be attracted to heat. Could be attracted to the sound of the saber. It's always an honor to get to witness anything or anyone transform into the force. What? Absolute psychopath mentality. I love death. Death is such an honor to witness. Guys, I think we found the Sith. It's not May. It's not Ezra Miller. It's not Mother 1 or Mother 2. It's not even the evil green lady. No, it's Jackie. Jackie is the evil mastermind. And why is she doing all of this? Because she loves to witness death. 
Also, transform into the Force is not what happens. They become one with the Force. It's not the same. We're not defined by what we lose. We're defined by what we survive. We've survived a lot. Jackie is as annoying as ever. I think this is what happens when you try to arbitrarily assign wisdom to a character who isn't old or experienced enough to have actually developed any. It just comes across really weird. Back with May and her friend's own simp, it appears these two have been running through the jungle for three hours. At least it's somewhat realistic with her resting. Better than Ahsoka and Sabine running a quarter marathon on uneven terrain through a jungle and not even being out of breath when they arrive to fight on the other side. And now they bring up the whole kill a Jedi without a weapon thing and they manage to confuse me even more when they do it. It's not a test. He calls it the final lesson. He says, your final lesson is when you teach yourself. You will kill a Jedi without a weapon. Attacking a defenseless person goes against everything the Jedi stands for. How do you kill someone like that? Unarmed. At first, I interpreted this as a complete 180 from what I had previously thought. I thought her explanation here implied that without a weapon means that the Jedi has no weapon, not the Acolyte, because it goes against every fibre of a Jedi's being to kill an unarmed person, so by the Acolyte disarming the Jedi and killing them, she is proving herself to be the polar opposite of a Jedi. And although I think I realised that's not actually what she was trying to say, it does actually kind of make sense in a weird twisted logic that's just dumb enough that I could believe it came from these writers. I thought that was why she was trying to grab their lightsabers to disarm them, so that she could murder them in cold blood and please her master. But then she says it's impossible, and that all started to fall apart. I couldn't follow her logic here. Did she mean that she couldn't bring herself to kill an unarmed person, yet she was totally fine poisoning Torben because he was wearing a lightsaber on his belt? But if he wasn't, she couldn't have done it? This was the point that I realised I'd totally misread that whole interaction. And what I think she's actually saying is is that by not using a weapon herself, the Jedi will not attack her because they do not attack unarmed people. But that makes no sense either because there's plenty of situations where it's okay to attack an unarmed person, especially if the unarmed person is using their hands and feet as weapons, striking civilians and innocent people like in episode one. And why does it even matter if the Jedi attack her or not? She could still kill them without having them attack her, especially in this bastardization of Star Wars where Jedi cannot sense life presence or force users. It'd be extremely difficult still, but my point is the whole Jedi do not attack unarmed people has no relevance to anything. So after all that, I'm honestly not even sure which reading of this scene was the correct one. I'm leaning towards the latter, but neither one makes complete sense. The whole scene is so convoluted and poorly explained that I just had to rewatch the whole conversation multiple times and I'm still not convinced I even know what they were trying to tell us. The dialogue reads like the writer knew what they meant when they were writing it, but they had never had anybody from the outside come in to proofread it. Because if they had, the proofreader would have pointed out how confusing it is for anybody who cannot look inside the mind of the writer and understand what they were trying to convey. And even if it did become clear on what it meant after multiple rewatches, it's still far from ideal because a talented writer does not require the audience to replay the conversation multiple times just to figure out the basics of what's going on. That's the job of the editor to make sure everything flows well enough and is easy enough to understand that it does not require that reread or rewatch. The dialogue is just so poorly constructed, it reads like bullet points and it jumps from one thing to another with no clear trail of logic between them. Anyway, May says it's impossible to kill a Jedi without a weapon, but if she doesn't do it, he will kill her. Oh no, poor Acolyte, we should all cry over her now. Wait, never mind, in the very same breath she also said she wants this more than anything. So excuse me if I don't view her as the victim. You don't even care. I sure don't. I care. Why? What is their relationship? How long has she known him? How do they meet? Who even is he? You know, after running through that forest for an extremely long time, I realized something. I don't need to do this anymore. I don't need to kill a Jedi without a weapon. I don't need to keep this deal. What? <laughs> what? She just had a change of heart? Just like that? I wish I could recreate my actual initial reaction to this scene because it absolutely cracked me up. The fake laugh I put on for the camera was just a poor imitation, but the amusement was real. This show is hilarious. She leaves him hanging there, which is obviously a bad choice for so many reasons. She should kill him. Oh, but she's good now. She was totally fine murdering two Jedi and threatening slash trying to kill multiple civilians in the bar. Even if she's had a change of loyalty, she's still a cold-blooded killer and I see no reason why she would suddenly decide to show mercy, especially when she fears her master so much and her whole survival depends on him never finding her. I had written in my notes, I hope Basil gets eaten, but unfortunately he did not. Sol tells Osha, once we get May safely to the ship, I'll explain everything, so yeah, he's obviously gonna die. And the Wookiee is dead too. What a waste. Least annoying character in the show and he's killed after just minutes of screen time. Absolute joke. Also, imagine writing a show so bad that the only tolerable character is the one who can't speak English. May sees the lightsaber wound on the Wookiee's chest and says, He's here. Okay, but why? Why would he be here?
Oh, get threaded. I'm so tired of Disney thinking Force users can fly. Holy heck, he's way more cringe up close. I would laugh so hard if Darth Gadar just ran Osha through with his lightsaber. Absolute cringe. I now understand why Mauler calls it Smilo Ren. What a perfect nickname. And that's the end. Wow. Clearly it's mother discipline. I mean, maybe not clearly, but that's my best guess so far. I think we're supposed to think that it's the apothecary, but it makes no sense why it would be him. Obviously, if he was the Sith, he could easily have freed himself from that rope trap, and he could probably get to the Wookiee before May. But where did he get his costume and lightsaber from? And his mask? May stole his pack with all his stuff, so he could only have had what he was carrying. A lightsaber could have been hidden on his person, but not a cloak or helmet, and it was a three hour run back to the ship, so if that's him in the mask, he would have had to have it stashed nearby. And I mean, maybe he did? We do know he's been here before when he first tracked the Wookiee, but I just don't see why he would have hidden his outfit here in advance. It's going to be really lame if it is just him and that's the big reveal. If it is, then there will probably be no explanation for all those questions I just raised. But I still think they're intentionally calling the master a he for all this time as a way to throw us off the scent. I think it's almost guaranteed to be a female Sith. I still think the theory that makes the most sense to me is that it's the Zabrak witch behind it all. The other mother was going to let Osha become a Jedi even though she didn't want to, and the Zabrak mother refused to let her daughter go. She somehow managed to kick off a fight that killed all the other witches. She's about the only one whose body we didn't see after all, and I think that she planned to take the girls with her and flee the Jedi. Then everything went wrong and May and Osha fell, Sol took Osha and the Zabrak somehow got separated from May. Seeking revenge, she redoubled her study of the dark side, possibly training under a real Sith Lord in hiding before locating Mei and taking her as an, as an apprentice. Now she's using Mei to get revenge on the Jedi. That's my theory at least, it's what I'm running with for now. There's still holes in it, but this show is full of holes, so that doesn't necessarily mean it won't happen. Equally likely though is that it will be something incredibly disappointing and boring, like that Inquisitor in Ahsoka who everyone was theorizing about, only for him to turn out to be literal green gas. In most cases with fan theories, particularly Star Wars theories, the fans' ideas end up being far better than what the writers actually wrote, and it won't surprise me if this show becomes yet another example of that phenomenon. So those are my thoughts on The Acolyte Episode 4. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, like the video if you want to, subscribe at your own risk, and until next time, keep your pen on the paper and your sword in the scabbard.